been following the discussion, uh, scientific discussion in these matters for the past years. And uh, but to have those specialists here and, and uh, seeing them interact with each other and, and with us is absolutely fantastic. It's so much more uh, informative than uh, browsing on the internet for the work they have done. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, I would like to start with one question. I'm gonna, you know, use my, use my, you know, situation here and <laughs> um, ask Chris Rowan about, because this has always been a, like, when we are saying we need to be careful, we need to, you know, let's not rush into anything if there's a possible, you know, danger for, for kids in terms of using um, iPads or, or, or tablets and so on. But then I get even inside the, the Reykjavik City Department of Education, there are people that are very pro-technology and uh, on this working group that I'm sitting in there also, and people, these, some of those people are saying, well, it's different if it's entertainment or if it's studying or learning. I know that there is not much research on you know, that in particular, you know, let alone just screen time uh, in general. But my question would then be, um, what is your uh, point of view on that? Thank you. Hello. Yes. Is that working? Yes. Um, so it, it's complex. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the ed, ed tech has potential, right? So we need to think of, I, I went through that slide really quickly. Who, what, when, where, why, how? Is we need to, we need to know that children with attention deficit are not going to learn from at all from ed tech. Um, the slower based uh, ed tech has better potential because it's not, it doesn't create that dopamine adrenaline rush so the brain can learn better. But um, the fast paced ed tech is uh, much more difficult for children to learn because it's, it is, has problems with attention deficit. So we, we need to look at individual children, not um, oh, grade three, you know, let's introduce this program, right? Um, the problems that I found when I work with government is that's the way they think, right? They don't take into account differential susceptibility, which is imperative, right? Uh, so what I see in schools is the kids that are being put on ed tech more frequently, who are on smart boards, who have their own iPads, are the children with delayed development, um, emotional, social issues, all the things, all the red flags. So we're, we're using more tech with the children we shouldn't be using any tech with. Um, so bringing awareness to that is really important. Uh, I encourage people with government to always say, show me the evidence. Mm -hmm. Show me the evidence that this is, this huge initiative you're going to do is going to work. I was in China, I spoke in Hong Kong and Beijing about three years ago. Government were at these, um, these talks that I gave because they identified themselves. They told me who they were and they sat right in the front. <laughs> um, it was very unnerving because I was told if you, um, if you do not, uh, uh, if you piss off the government, they will, they can, <laughs> they can prevent you from coming back. A colleague of mine, that happened, right? So I was trying to be very cautious. But what was exciting is they do have now over, I think it's almost 400 centers for addictions. They identified this as an addiction in 2008. They um, have, I think it's eight now different governments that are involved in funding you know, treatment, and they're moving forward. They're very progressive. They have the highest PISA scores in the world. Um, PISA being the, the test that's done in 72 countries with our 15-year-olds every three years. Hong Kong um, is right up there. So uh, they only use an average of an hour a day. 
of tech. So these are the things we need to bring forward to our governments and say, um, you know, the, the Organization of uh, Economic Cooperation and Development came out with a very strong statement against ed tech, profiling that the countries that use the most tech have the lowest PISA scores. The countries that use the least tech have the highest PISA scores, like China and South Korea. So, you know, that's, that's really important to bring that up. Thank Did I answer your question? Yes, well, somewhat, you know, like this, this is not, you know, yeah, absolutely for me, but you know, this is not a yes or no question, so, uh, answer, so this is complicated, like you said, in the beginning of the, of the answer. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Christine will bring you the microphone and uh, speak, yeah. speak uh, keep it close yeah. to your... Okay, hi, my name is Linda. I am a teacher, but I'm also here with my mom and my sister, so the question's from all of us. Uh, we, were, we were wondering, like, you're talking about average tech time. Uh, has it been any study on, like, uh, so it's average one hour, but if it's no, 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 no hour and, and two hours, has it been any studies on that? Is it worse, or <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Both technology, both like educationally, no, not educationally, no, both like sociology and exposure of radiation. Um, there, there has been, I do know of data around video games, yeah. where uh, with video games, uh, somewhere between the one to two hours a day um, is not as harmful as when you get into three to four and, and going up, right? So it's, it's um, and I imagine, I, I don't, that's the only research that I know of is on video games, but I would imagine in other areas too, it kind of goes like this, right? So the, the more you use, the more detrimental it's going to be. I don't know if anyone else wants to, Not good. Um, one thing I didn't have, <laughs> yeah, one thing I didn't have time to discuss is, um, if I can borrow this, Leonard, the, uh, this is a, a zonometer. It measures energy. Uh, if your, your energy has to be in the zone to learn, if it's sleepy like Yana, you can't learn. Hyper like Milo, you can't learn. So I did um, my own study with TV at that time, because this was maybe seven years ago. And what I found after 20 minutes, so the children started TV in the zone after 20 minutes of passive TV watching, they went out of the zone, right? So that's what you have to understand, I think, with your children. And um, Ingrid's children were quite different, right? So again, you can't use the age, but when do you lose lose the child? When do they no longer want to come to dinner? When do they start to cry when you take the device away? Um, that's the limit. So going three hours straight on the weekend, think of their heart, you know, and their blood pressure. It's, it's not good. So um, smaller doses, better, right? Definitely. And any more questions maybe on uh, other matters we have? Um, it would be nice to touch on uh, radi radiation also or, or Come exposure. I'm Bryndis and I'm in the school of school. I'm going to ask you a question to Björn, so I'm going to ask you a question in English. My question is for Björn, so I might speak Icelandic this time. Um, uh, ég er að velta fyrir mér, uh, ert að sjá hraða aukningu í því að börn sem að koma inn á bugl hafi sem sagt, já, aukin vandamál sem tengjast þá sem sagt, tölvu, notkun tölvu bík og einhverju slíku. Ert að sjá sem sagt, mikla aukningu í þessu, er, myndur segja meiri hluti barna sem koma inn á bugl sé með einhverju vandamál þessu tengt? So the question is, I'm working at a 
psychiatric outward pa patient clinic. And the question is whether the problems regarding electronic screen use is growing or becoming more severe. I don't know. We haven't done any research in Iceland, and that's uh, a pity. Uh, but I, th what I think we are now in a phase where the awareness among uh, the workers or, 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 or the professionals in, in, in the clinic is growing. And we use more and more of our clinical encounters to address these issues. And I think that the t most important take home message for you all regarding this session is that there are vulnerable populations. I think the cancer research shows that there are some persons that cannot tolerate uh, the radiation because in time they will develop cancer, uh, glioblastome or, 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 or meningioma. And I think from, from I, 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 I don't know from a scientific point, but my understanding as a medical doctor, I think that that's a form of a vulnerable population that develops uh, cancer due to the radi radiation. In child and adolescent psychiatry, we have the same situation. There are populations of children and adolescents that cannot tolerate this rapid growth of technology. And I was just talking with Chris Rowan that I think it is growing so fast that we as parents and as clinicians, we don't even know ourselves how to uh, cope with this rapid development. So I, I find it very imperative before f further growth of this reality, and especially the virtual reality, we have to be very careful with res regard to children and adolescents. And uh, uh, I think that, that Albert Einstein was right, that when the technology surpasses our human encounters, we have a problem. And we create, I don't know, I wouldn't say idiots, but we create patients either psychological patients or children that cannot learn at school or in 30 or 40 years, I'm certain that we will have an epidemic of brain cancer. That is what the, the, the excellent lecturer told us and warned, warned us about, that we are in the middle of an experiment and we have to be very careful, we have to reduce the use Otherwise, we will create a huge problems. May I have a comment? I, I think uh, these les les lectures about uh, screen time uh, have been really excellent. And for me, it's very much opening an eye. So I had uh, one question, and it is, do you have an ICD code for this uh, disease or condition, or what we will ca call it, so that you could follow the statistics? Because I know, for example, in uh, Sweden, electrosensitivity which I think is real. There is no code for that. So doctors cannot uh, make a sick leave uh, or prescribe a sick leave for an electrosensitive person. They have to give depression or something else, which is not a real diagnosis and can even be devastating for a p patient to get that type of diagnosis. But if we can give proper diagnostic codes for these conditions or diseases, uh, we, we can follow the statistics in the, follow in the, in the future. I can comment on that. We, we have in the DSM-5 system uh, a new uh, working diagnosis, Internet Gaming Disorder. It, it hasn't been used a lot. Uh, it is still in, in development. But in the ICD system, ICD-10 that we use in Iceland, we have a code uh, of environmental diagnosis, and it is uh, uh, set 73.2. It's the number, and it's called lack of relaxation and leisure. And in my opinion, that describes the electronic screen syndrome that Victor Tankley uh, came up with two, uh, three years ago. Uh, it describes the problem quite nicely. 
because children who overuse media, electronic media, they become sleep, sleep deprived, they lack interest, they, they lack interest in other uh, entertainment than, than, than the media use. So that is the code that I have been using clinically. And I find it, uh, because this is an environmental agent, I think the coating should be an environmental one. That's, that's awesome. I love it. I'm writing that down. That's really cool. Um, I, I didn't have an opportunity to speak about... Uh, Stuart Brown wrote a book called Play. And he's a brilliant... He's a neurophysiologist uh, who studies play. He created a play inventory. And he went into prisons and did this play inventory and found that, that predominantly people in prisons did not have any play history. They could not go back and say, oh, I, you know, I used to uh, play with my you know, friends outside. They had a lot of trauma in their lives preventing them from play. The other thing he found is that they did not build things with their hands ever. So he was asked by NASA to consult with NASA because they had um, a, a whole bunch of their staff had gone uh, and retired and they were in the midst of building a, um, a station, a space station. And they brought this new, younger people in and they could not conceptualize in the 3D. And he, so he did their play histories and found, again, a poverty in play, a poverty of building things with their hands. And they had such a hard time to envision this three-dimensional world. So I think, you know, this is really a huge statement, you know, lack of relaxation and leisure, lack of play. Our children need to play outside. Go outside and play. <laughs> Yeah. My name is Ausleg and I work uh, as a project manager in the tech department in the School of Education. Uh, I have also two boys, one is nine years old and the other one 13 years old. And I've been very concerned for a very long time about all these devices and how it affects them. And uh, what I would like to ask is about when we're at home, is the wi wireless internet or the 3G, 4G, which one is more harmful, do you think, or is it the same thing? Would you want to like, like to point the question to someone in particular? Or? Uh, no, I would like to hear okay. maybe, yeah, the more the better. Um, yeah, that's actually relatively straightforward. The, the exposure they're going to get from a home Wi-Fi is going to be substantially phone network is basically the, the farther the signal has to reach, the stronger the signal has to be. So if you're trying to get to a cell tower that's longer away, the phone's working very hard to get a very strong signal. Children don't know. They have their data service, they have 4G, and they have the wireless, and they just use Right, it's a good question, and, and yeah, you can, um, wireless is going to work. Yes, uh, good question. And may I just give a comment? And I think we haven't discussed at all the fifth generation, 5G, which somebody t said, well, we know it will be implemented within a couple of years. And it will be very high frequency, much higher than those which are used now. And this means that the skin absorption will be much higher than for the previous lower uh, frequencies. So those who think that there, I there are skin problems by microwaves or radio frequencies, uh, there's a real concern because the exposure will be much higher. And I think Tarmo knows more, more about this type of exposure, which also, also will be somewhat different. And these base stations are planned to be put within 100 or 200 <coughs> meters from each other in buildings. So it will be very much equipped and with a 5G because of the self-driving cars and whatever is discussed. And also these uh, Internet of Things. So they are building in different uh, uh, machines that you need at home, uh, 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 a transmitter device. And 
uh, I think that there is a risk that they will build in uh, the net, uh, the wireless uh, connection in your homes, if you want it or not, because that's what they will 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 have to to sell to us. So, so this is a huge problem with 5G, which uh, we are about to to face. And I think that somebody to said that uh, this has not been tested at all. We don't really know what 5G means to us and I think that the, the situation will be much worse with 5G than we have facing now. I had just a comment about this uh, addiction or what we would call it because I went um, by train from the town where I live in Örebro to Stockholm to fly here, two hours uh, train trip and next to me was, came a family sitting, a father and a mother and two uh, boys. One was about uh, seven years, the other 12 or 13. Immediately when they sat around the table, they took up the smartphones and they were texting and using the smartphone the whole journey. Nobody said a word to each other. So they were silent for two hours. And when, they, when we arrived to Stockholm, then they started to tell the boys, take the clothes on, etc. I think it was awful. I mean, they were sitting two hours with their smartphones, looking at them and not communicating to each other. Uh, at all. I don't know what Chris would say, but <laughs> 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 you would like that as an example. <laughs> they looked quite normal. <clears throat> if, if I can say about this 5G, this is really something very new. We don't know anything about it. And here are a few examples. First of all, 5G is such a high frequency that it will be absorbed by skin alone. Secondly, this frequency will make standing wave of radiation between this epidermis and dermis. In this layer between of the in this layer of this living skin, between this dead skin top layer and dermis, there will be formed standing wave. So meaning those cells which are there in epidermis will be in this standing wave. What the standing wave will do to, to those cells, nobody knows. It was never studied. And uh, even research can go this way further, te technological research, that is talk about this, that you can put several wireless devices on your body, attached to your skin, and they don't need wires to communicate between themselves they can send signals through the skin. So in this skin, the standing wave, they can send signals and one device communicate with another device without any wires, without sending signals elsewhere, just through the skin, save energy. Then there is another problem uh, with ICNIRP and 5G. Because ICNIRP is preparing and, and industry is preparing standards for 5G, uh, how to uh, evaluate it, how to measure it, how to implement it, and so on and so forth. And uh, if somebody is in more interested about this, I have written recently one of my blogs, uh, a report from science and wireless event in Australia. And there is written few words about it. But point was this, that our body in, in respect to radiation, whether it was 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, or 5G, was divided into these important parts and so-called extremities. Extremities were those non-essential parts. So, for example, for 3G or 4G, those extremities were hands or legs. But our corpse, that was important part, but head was important part, but hands were not so important part. Then sometime people are asking, you know, how it is? People say that don't keep cell phone close to your body, but then you put it to your ear, to your head. No, you don't put it to your head. You put it to extremity. Your ear has been classified as extremity. So meaning when they say, keep your cell phone one inch away from your body, it works because this ear provides this space one inch from your brain. It is everything fine, it is everything safe. But, and also there is this sort of issue that extremities
can be exposed to higher level of radiation, meaning this important part of the body have certain level of radiation that is considered safe. Extremities can be twice as much exposed. Now, in preparation of, of uh, um, what is important, what is unimportant for 5G, ICNIRP is proposing that skin will be within extremities. This is less important. Meaning the only organ, the largest organ of human body, the only organ that will be absorbing radiation will be considered as extremity. What it means that it will be allowed to expose it more than those other important parts, which otherwise will not get any radiation because it will no, not get deeper than the skin. So these are those problems that on one hand, we don't have faintest idea what the standing wave will do in our epidermis. Second thing, already is being prepared that industry gadgets can expose our skin more because it will be extremity, unimportant. Whereas skin, if you ask dermatologists, it is very important piece of our body. It is the largest organ of our body. Our immune response depends on skin. That's the problem. Uh, just, just a comment uh, that there's of course a concern about malignant melanoma if you uh, look into the skin. We made a study some years ago that was some indication of slightly increased risk of melanoma on the side of the head where, where the exposure was from the mobile phone. But uh, there needs to be longer time studies for melanoma and malignant melanoma, at least in Sweden, is the malignant uh, cancer form type that is mostly increasing. It's steeping up uh, the incidence rate. And we don't really know what the microwaves are doing. We know that the UV light, of, of course, is a risk factor. Uh, I just wanted to comment about what, what the 5G is. Maybe many of you do not understand. It's, uh, if, if it, uh, at this point, we use uh, uh, 3 gigahertz for mobile networking, then the 5G will introduce tens of gigahertz. It's like um, even 40 gigahertz. And these are no longer microwaves, these are millimeter waves. And they have, as Tarius very well explained, it, these have totally different uh, biological effects. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, millimeter waves are used as a weapon. Uh, there are armies that use uh, active denial systems which direct millimeter waves to the attacking enemy and they will feel as their skin is burning. Of course, these weapons use uh, much more higher intensity power as, as we uh, expect from the 5G. But uh, it is also interesting to know that um, uh, already for a period of 10 years or so on the market there are millimeter therapy devices which are very low power, less than one milliwatt. And, uh, and these are used to change the metabolism of the, of the, of the cells. And these are mainly used in Russia and the form, former Soviet uh, Union um, uh, states. Uh, in, the, in the West, these devices are not so well known, but they indeed have a biological effect. And these are very, very low power devices and they're based on the res resonant effect on the cells and, and on water mole molecules. Uh, one of these frequencies is 42 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, actually, these were and it will be an extremely interesting period. Maybe it will be very beneficial frequency because uh, in the Soviet time when Soviet space program was developing talking systems for the space, space um, capsules uh, and there was a flu epidemic season and the entire building, all the institutes, uh, hundreds of workers were ill and the only department that was not ill was the, was the department who was developing the docking systems radar navigation system with 40, 40 gigahertz. So maybe, maybe after all we will be saved. <laughs> from this, from this electromagnetic menace. <laughs> but um, the original question addressed the reception level, which is better Wi-Fi or 3G or 4G. Uh, this is a very, um, if I may say, a cynical question because none of these will 
um, relieve the electromagnetic radiation, but both are accompanied. So the very strict answer is that none of these can be considered as an alternative. But um, uh, if we go technical, then measurements show that if you show that if you have the mobile mast very close by, like in the next door, uh, next door building, then the even the even the 4G and 3G may be lower than Wi-Fi radiation level. But these are in few cases only. But um, let's say that you have a very low radiation from your smartphone or your tablet. But the most uh, problematic thing is that uh, the, the uh, tablet and the smartphone have in built-in antennas. And if you hold these devices, you actually do not know where the antenna is. And you may be uh, covering the antenna by which uh, the device thinks that um, uh, the mast is very far away and it will, it will maximize its power out output and you will be exposed a lot to radiation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you know anything about the virtual reality um, emissions. Uh, I know the LED um, it's, it's much higher in virtual reality. So in, in North America, they're now, they're on the market. Um, children are using them. Yes. And so I was just wondering if they are emitting more radiation than, say, a cell phone? They're radiating a different part of the brain. So you're, you know, we're, we're covering new territory by putting it here instead right. of here. So, um, you know, I would say those devices should not be used if they're connected to a, a network of any kind. Um, just seems like a bad idea. I mean, I, I think this question of like the 5G and new technology is really important because it, it gets at the core of the whole problem we face, which is that these technologies are being developed very rapidly. A new technology comes in, they can say, hey, this is lower power, and we don't have any research to say it's bad, it's a whole new issue, and there's you know, billions of dollars invested in rolling it out, and if you think a bunch of scientists sitting at a table in Iceland are gonna stop them, you're kidding yourselves. You know? And so I, I think we're gonna constantly be playing catch up with these technologies in terms of looking at health risks and trying to uh, be a moderating voice, uh, and it's, I don't know, I really don't know the solution to that. Um, we are out of time actually, 10 minutes past, but I know that Tarmo, who's, uh, he was interested in uh, you know, a question about uh, having the mast on the house or, or the, uh, the uh, uh, transmitter, and he has uh, a picture of a slider what he would like to discuss with us. Yes, thank sure, you. Sure. Thank you very much. We had this uh, question that was left open if, if there is a mobile phone mast on, the on top of the school building. So we have, uh, we have actually this situation not in the school but at the university's uh, rooftop. So and we have measured this. And, and um, here you can see the mast on, on top of the roof. And uh, uh, often you have the situation where it, uh, the building is not a cube. It has some facets and, and inside corners. So there is an extremely high radiation area on the top floors because, as you can see, the, the antenna is not facing only outwards, but it's also the ray is also hitting its, the building itself. And there is the result. It's like uh, the, the, at the top floors, you have less, uh, 10 times more radiation as on the lower floors due to the antenna. This is what I just wanted to point out. May I make a short comment on about 5G? I, I think it's uh, the whole situa situation uh, regarding uh, science is re really doesn't closer, work. Just closer to your mouth. Okay, uh, regarding science, it doesn't work very well. Uh, I mean, we have been shouting out for years that there is a problem, there is a brain tumor risk, etc., and other uh, health effects uh, that we at least suspect are there. Nothing happens because the those who make the policy, they don't uh, uh, listen to us. So I think that uh, there needs to be education of the population and there needs to be active NGOs uh, 
uh, non-governmental org organizations that make the pressure. Uh, and uh, also that we have, regarding the education, that you can make your, your um, uh, choice by yourself. I mean, I don't need to use the Google Glass, or I don't you need to use this virtual reality device. I don't need to use the smartphone all the time, etc. or at least uh, use uh, earpiece and the cable to the phone. So there are, there are many things that can be done if we learn more about that. And I think this conference is an excellent uh, uh, type of meetings that should be done more to, to, to educate each other, educate those who are using the devices, educating us who are doing the science and learning more about that and, and listening to other scientists from other disciplines. Uh, so, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, okay. You were telling us about that the, it has, oh, it's been uh, aggressing. Uh, you have a lot more children with autism. So, uh, do you think that comes from the children using uh, all kind of devices, or the parents, or what, where would it come from? Well, the study, um, I'll just speak briefly, and then I think we're going to break, but I, I'll be here after, so we can talk more. Um, the study that I quoted, a 2015 study, was had identified between the ages of nine months and 18 months a critical period for socialization and quantified that children exposed to screens during that time, excessive use of screens, it was over four hours a day. So that meant they were possibly just sitting on the parent's lap, but um, being exposed to the screens. You can imagine if I'm watching TV and I have my baby, I'm nursing my baby, um, I'm not looking at my baby. My baby is looking at me looking at the screen. So the baby looks at the screen. It's social modeling, right? So that um, much higher incidence of a ASD, um, autism spectrum disorder, as well as, uh, prob they called it problematic behaviors, right? So preliminary research, very early, but enough to warn parents of young children to not be exposed to technology, even passive watching. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Christine, I'm in the board of this organization, and I wanted to point out something that the mayor said this morning, and I don't know if anyone translated it to you, but his generation and mine, it was to become an Icelander, you were drunk downtown at 14, 15 years of age, took the last bus or maybe not, and walked for hours home and stuff like that. So maybe we as parents, we are just so happy that our teenagers are at home in their devices because then they're not doing drugs or drinking alcohol. <laughs> and even though I have a small child at four, you know, being in the board of this organization, I also have a teenager who's al almost 19. And when I was complaining, you know, turning off the router and everything, and then she used to say it. I'm not doing drugs, mom. I'm not a bad <laughs> teenager. Why are you acting like this? <laughs> so that connects with our generation. We are so glad that our teenagers are not there. But then, of course, there are new challenges and new things to look out for. Uh, I would say these devices can be as addicting and as potentially destructive as drugs and alcohol. I mean, I, you know, so I wouldn't, I don't think that's an um, appropriate level of solace to take in having your kid in the room on their devices. <laughs> No, I agree. Of course, they are bullying. They are being bullied. There are all kinds of... But I think we have been sleeping, you know, or, you know, think it's better. But now, after this day, we, we probably agree who, has, who we are attending better. this meeting that it's not necessarily so. It's, it's actually being termed digital heroin. They use video games uh, for in burn units for debriding skin. Video games are more effective for pain relief than morphine. So just think, 
when your kids are, are gaming, they are taking a drug. You know, it's not like you're injecting it into their skin, but I guess with the EMF radiation, you are kind of putting it into their skin, right? But it's a drug, and we, got, we have to be very careful. I think this is not only with, with children, because, you know, I have this discussion with a lot of people. I'm trying to keep it leveled, and, but I get some very extreme um, response from some adults. And sometimes I feel like I'm taking a candy from a baby because they are like, you know, this is all bogus. You don't know anything about this. It's true. I have it. I have the Internet. It says this is Wikipedia, you know. So it's uh, uh, the, the problem extends to the adult people. Yeah, it's more like a comment because we're speaking about autism and uh, what about the mother that has, you know, is pregnant and she's always on her device and uh, the, the fetus is constantly being bombarded with a. Uh, why fry, f we fry or <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I mean, that must also, it starts there, right? Mm -hmm. What, what uh, might be said about that is that a huge use of electronic media creates a situation of chronic stress. And chronic stress in pregnancy is a bad thing, both for the mother and for the fetus. So I think uh, that, that is... Uh, Good point. Yes, and there is actually a lot of rather large study on that. The D1 study, I think it's called, where they have followed uh, children to, I mean, uh, when the mother was using this techno technology during the pregnancy, and actually they have found cognitive defects in these children. So there is some evidence in the literature. I, I, I don't know the real details because it's not my expertise, but but uh, there is at least one study and they have followed them for more years and still uh, the cognitive problems uh, are there. So it seems to be a critical exposure time during the fetal period. Uh, Darius has a comment. About this study about this cognitive problem, in the end, it is not known that the cognitive problems arose from this exposure to radiation from mama being busy and not paying attention. Also, I would like to point out that if, you, if the mother is holding a laptop or tablet PC on, on her uh, body, it's not only radiating wireless radiation, radio frequencies, but also uh, low frequency radiation, electric field, magnetic field, and uh, intermediate frequencies uh, produced by the main board. So any of these could be affecting the fetus. Okay, I think that uh, we are out of time. Uh, this has been very interesting, and uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for coming today. And um, uh, and uh, for the uh, uh, for the appearance of our prestige uh, specialists that are here today with us. And uh, which you know, if they wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here. And we wouldn't be having this discussion. And we truly hope that th this is the beginning of a uh, good discussion uh, in a responsible way, um, uh, so we can we can um, take take measures if we need. And it's to me it seems that we need to take some measures and be be, be careful, and uh, uh, and uh, make sure that our children uh, are safe in school and in our homes. And again, thank you um, for coming. It's uh, been a pleasure. It will be more pleasure later on when we, when we take you out for dinner. Not you, <laughs> not you guys. <laughs> and uh, I can get my lunch. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we will have the chance of seeing you again at some point. And Darius up there and you here in the panel. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Bye-bye.